Hey guys, welcome back to BASED. This month I have a special episode for you. We're going to do something a little bit different because one thing I get asked by my followers all the time is how to go and actually do the real work. I know a lot of people follow me, they get excited about the things I'm talking about, they get passionate about the policies, and they wanna go in and affect change. And a lot of people are looking for ways that they can better do that. I've been giving a speech across the country called My Theory of Change, and I decided that I think it's time to turn it into a based episode. So today we're gonna dig into that. If you're new to my channel, or if you just started seeing my videos one day and I came out of nowhere for you, you may not know my background. So I'll give you a quick summary. Unlike many people who work in politics, I didn't mean to end up here. I didn't go to school to do what I do. I didn't grow up dreaming of running for office. I grew up wanting to be Selena. And that is what I pursued. My first career was in Nashville's music industry, and I thought that I would be doing that forever. I actually stumbled into politics when I found myself really bored in my career and just feeling like it lacked purpose and meaning. So I started looking at going back to school to either be a lawyer or a psychologist. I wanted to help people. And to help me pick between those two fields, I started volunteering and taking on some side jobs. I started working for a Second Amendment group in Tennessee alongside an attorney, and I went to volunteer at NAMI, or the National Alliance on Mental Illness. NAMI found out that I was doing the two-way work and asked if I would consider lobbying pro bono for them. And thus, through both of these avenues I was pursuing, I actually ended up working on public policy and really falling in love with that. I moved into politics full-time in 2016, and since then, I've been a part of overturning the death penalty in three states, passing workforce development and reentry criminal justice reforms, passing better protections for people with mental illness in our justice system, passing Tennessee's first school choice program, and eliminating their last income tax. I also helped pass protections for things like direct primary care, overturned certificate of need laws, repealed numerous occupational licenses, and also worked to sue the state pro bono alongside a litigation team that led to significant property protections. Along the way, at pretty much every step of my journey, I've been told by people that I can't get done what I've gotten done. You can't overturn the death penalty because all the blue states have already done it. You can't have a career as a libertarian, you're going to have to pick one of the major two parties. You're not going to get any immediate attention for your issues because they're too niche. And I tell you all of this because I want you to know that people are wrong, that you too can get big things done without the proper education, without the pedigree, without the backing of the two major parties. And today, I want to talk about how. The liberty movement has a lot going for us, despite what others may try to tell you. Our movement is made up of a lot of strong-willed, independently-minded people, and I think that's fantastic. Our movement is comprised of leaders, not followers, which is something you don't find that often in many political movements. We often joke about the infighting among libertarians, and to be sure, there are some behaviors in our movement I'm going to call out. But when it comes to the rigorous debate you find here, I think it's great. There's a lot of iron sharpening iron, and a lot of people who are passionate about beating back the government, both for their own sake and for others. I think that makes you everyday heroes. And the good news is, we do not need to agree on everything to affect meaningful change. The way I've been able to get so much done in my six years in politics is through building diverse coalitions, convincing people to work with me, and creating movements that were able to energize a base without a lot of money. These successes can be replicated all over the country, and it's imperative that we commit ourselves to this kind of mission. Because I am not interested in sitting around and discussing economic theory all day. I know I work for the Foundation for Economic Education. These things are important. But what I'm interested in is putting those ideas and beliefs into actions that actually make a difference in people's lives. A lot has happened over the past two years. And for libertarians, it's basically been one big continual, I told you so. I don't want to minimize the horrible impacts of COVID and COVID policies because a lot of lives have been permanently scarred because of them, but there is a silver lining, and that is that people who were previously unreachable for us in our ideas are now eyes wide open. They're waking up. For those who've been active in politics for a while, we know that the pandemic policies were merely just the latest infringements on our rights. The truth is, these violations of individual liberty have only been possible because of decades of executive actions, legislation, and bad legal precedent that had already greatly expanded governmental power when COVID came along. These things don't just happen overnight. There are a lot of people who want to use these times and events to make you angry. Because to be honest, there's a lot of money to be made off your anger. It produces clicks, it makes people tune in 24 seven to cable news, it keeps you on social media platforms longer, it tends to make people more tribalistic, which means you'll be a more dependable voter, donor, or volunteer. Outrage sells, it is seductive. And the thing is, I'm not going to tell you that you should not be angry, because there's a place for that. There's a lot of injustice and corruption out there. 
But it is problematic to leave people there, and you should be wary of anyone who seeks to invoke that kind of emotion without directing it towards concrete change. I want to teach you how to turn that anger into activism, and I want to give you hope. I think hope is the one thing really lacking in our system right now. People feel beat. They don't feel capable of fighting back. They look around and see endless amounts of corruption. They see how far we've moved from our foundations, and they largely see other apathetic people surrounding them. And they start to feel like the battle is over. And I get it. I have some days like that too. And on the one hand, it really is as bad as you think and worse. The longer I work around politics, the more I find out. It's just like this iceberg of injustice that keeps going beneath the surface. We're up against a lot, and I'm not going to sugarcoat that for you. But on the other hand, thanks to technology and the age of information, there has never been a better time to fight back. Never before in history have people had as much information about what their government is doing. Never before have people been able to build online communities with others across the country who share their ideology. There is so much possibility, and there's never been a better time to have so many strong-willed, independently-minded people in your camp. In my opinion, it's go time. So where to start if you're one of the people feeling small or boxed out of the system? I have some good news to offer you. You only need 3.5% of the population to affect political change. That's right. Research by Erica Chinowith, who is a political scientist at Harvard University, shows it only takes around 3.5% of the population actively participating in nonviolent civil disobedience to ensure serious political change. Not only that, the research goes a bit further and indicates that civil disobedience is not only the moral way to affect change, it is the single most powerful way of shaping politics by a long shot. Furthermore, she found that there weren't any campaigns that failed to affect change after they achieved 3.5% participation during a peak event. And while her research is a bit more recent, it actually builds upon what many significant leaders in our history have known and preached for some time. From the African-American abolitionist Sojourner Truth, to the women's suffrage campaigner Susan B. Anthony, to the Indian independence activist Mahatma Gandhi, and to U.S. civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., all have convincingly argued for the power of peaceful protest. For most of my adult life, I lived in Nashville, Tennessee, and what you may not know about Nashville is its importance in the civil rights movement. I know most people think of Alabama or Mississippi when it comes to civil rights, but it's important you know about the Nashville sit-ins. The Nashville sit-in movement is widely regarded as one of the most successful and sustained student-directed sit-in campaigns of the civil rights era. There used to be these large department stores on Fifth Avenue, downtown Nashville. It was a big shopping district, and in them you would have these lunch counters segregated lunch counters. A known pacifist, James M. Lawson, and the Nashville Student Movement, which was an organization comprised of students from the city's four black colleges, made plans to launch a large-scale sit-in campaign targeting these segregated lunch counters. And the backstory to this event is every bit as important as what ultimately happened. Lawson actually trained these students to sustain physical abuse and other kinds of assault. They practiced self-discipline and self-control through stimulated workshops for weeks before the actual events. Why did they do this? Well, one, they knew without a doubt that their actions, while peaceful, would inevitably result in violence against them. But also, Lawson and MLK Jr. himself held to a theory of nonviolence. And this theory revolved around six principles which were heavily influenced by the teachings of Jesus and Gandhi. So briefly, I want to go over the six principles of nonviolence, which are a major part of my personal theory of change. The first is that nonviolence is not for the faint of heart. Practicing nonviolence takes strength and resolve. It's not a pathway for people who seek to avoid conflict, as there's nothing passive about it. Rather, this is an active stance emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Those who practice nonviolence are always looking for ways to persuade their opponents and looking for methods to affect change. They're actually in community with people who are suffering and working to build bridges of influence to those who are in power, seeking to build support for their cause. The second principle of nonviolence is that it seeks to defeat injustice, not people. MLK said, is it not true that those who commit evil are also victims of its power? King knew that the true battle for justice lies between good and evil, darkness and light. He saw those who would oppress him as also being victims of systemic injustice. Seeing one's enemy in this light really helps us to view them sympathetically and focus on the root cause of the problem. King again echoed the Bible when he said that our struggle is ultimately not against particular people, but systems, which he labeled principalities and powers. His third principle of nonviolence taught that the goal of nonviolence is reconciliation. A wise man knows that you don't change a person by mocking or humiliating them. And on this topic, King wrote, 
Nonviolence does not seek to defeat or humiliate the opponent, but to win friendship and understanding. The nonviolent resistor must often express his protests through non-cooperation or boycotts, but he realizes that these are not ends themselves. They are merely means to awaken a sense of moral shame in the opponent. The aftermath of nonviolence is a creation of a community, while the aftermath of violence is tragic bitterness. We're not trying to own the libs or pummel the Republicans. We're trying to win friends. Next, and this one is most important to me, uh, King said that redemptive suffering holds transformational power. In other words, there is a power in undeserved suffering. I think that is incredibly deep. The nonviolent resistor, he said, is willing to accept violence if necessary, but not to inflict it, knowing that the suffering they endure has great power to change hearts and minds. King paraphrased Gandhi when he wrote this, We will match your capacity to inflict suffering with our capacity to endure suffering. We will meet your physical force with soul force. We will not hate you, but we cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws. Do to us what you will, and we will still love you. Bomb our homes and threaten our children. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our communities and drag us out on some wayside road, beating us and leaving us half dead, and we will still love you. But we will soon wear you down by our capacity to suffer. And in winning our freedom, we will so appeal to your heart and conscience that we will win you in the process. That kneecaps me. The fifth point under this theory is that nonviolence pertains to physical acts and internal thoughts. The nonviolent resistor refuses to physically harm his opponent, but they also refuse to hate them. At the base of nonviolent philosophy is the principle of love. And for King, love specifically meant the agape kind of love, which is discussed by Plato. And he said it was proof of the power of God working within us, enabling us to care for those who would seek to harm us. Nonviolent love is in a way a weapon, he said, because it disarms your opponent and shields you from becoming them. And lastly, the principle of nonviolence you're probably most familiar with is that the universe is on the side of justice. King was an eternal optimist, and to do this work consistently, optimism is an essential outlook. King said, the believer in nonviolence has deep faith in the future. He knows that in his struggle for justice, he has cosmic companionship. There is a creative force in the universe that works to bring the disconnected aspects of reality into a harmonious whole. And I believe that. I believe we will win. I wouldn't be in this work if I didn't. We have to play the long game. So to bring all of this back to the Nashville students in their workshops, they were doing more than simply learning to not physically fight back. They were training their minds with the principles of nonviolence, and they needed it. Because once the sit-ins began, there was mass violence towards them. They were burned with cigarettes. They were spit on. They were spoken to in ways we will never repeat. They were beaten, kicked in the head by police. And through it all, they did not react. And because they were able to live out these principles, they woke a nation up. The pictures that appeared on newspapers were of well-dressed, respectful, young, beautiful people quietly trying to eat their lunch while being violently attacked and not fighting back. And that suffering that they sustained invoked sympathy and outrage and moral shame and demands for change. That small group of students sat down at a counter and changed the nation. And it didn't take long for them to rally 3.5% of the country to their cause. We in the liberty movement need to take lessons from those who have come before us. There's really no excuse for us to not be successful. While we're constantly told we're in the minority or that we cannot compete with the two-party system, the numbers tell a different story. According to a 2020 Gallup poll, 31% of Americans identify as Democrats, 25% identify as Republicans, and 41% are independent. There are more people fed up with the corrupt two-party system than there are disciples of it, and again, we only need to activate 3.5% of them. In order to do that though, I'm a firm believer that everyone in our movement needs to read How to Win Friends and Influence People. And this is the second component of my theory of change. I'm, I'm literally not joking, guys. This is a timeless classic by successful businessman Dale Carnegie, and I read it at least once a year. Whether you're trying to be a successful person in sales, run for office, organize groups of people, or even just get along better with your neighbor, this book has essential principles to live by. There is unfortunately no shortage of people in our movement who care more about being right than they do about being effective. And when it comes to that 3.5% number we're going for, they run off more people than they win to our cause. And I know we often joke about the bickering in the liberty movement, but I personally don't find it funny because this is not a vanity project to me. There are real lives on the line. 
And every person that leaves the movement because of the behavior of these people puts us another hour away from the justice we seek. We can disagree with one another or with outsiders without being a turnoff. Again, mocking people, putting people down, publicly shaming people, these tactics only stir up bitterness and resentment. They make the targets dig in their heels and draw further into their camp. And they cause the insulters to be seen as enemies instead of potential partners to affect change. I implore you to distance yourself from people who conduct themselves in this way because they're sinking ships who ultimately become as big of a barrier to change as those they oppose. Remember, Martin Luther King Jr.'s principles include a safeguard against becoming what you hate. If you want to actually affect change, you cannot use these tactics because they only further divide us and create disharmony. Instead, let's look at some of Dale Carnegie's practices. First, he said if you want to win friends and influence people, you must be likable. I know, I know, you would think that this was obvious, but it does not appear to be, so I'm gonna go through it. Here are six ways to be likable. One, he said become genuinely interested in other people. Stop talking about yourself. Find out about them. You need to be genuinely curious in other people and their perspectives. That means that when you start talking to somebody, don't immediately start talking about the Fed. Most people are not interested in the Fed yet. Start with what they're interested in, what concerns them. Two, he said, smile. And I don't mean like smile, men in, in the street shouting at you to smile. I mean, be a happy, positive person. Nobody likes an Eeyore. Three, he said, remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. People love the sound of their name so much that they will often donate large amounts of money just to have a building named after themselves. If you can remember their names, you can work wonders. Next, he said, be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. Many times people don't want an entertaining conversation partner, they just want someone who will listen to them. And this is especially true for people who feel they've been harmed by the system. And I promise you, you don't have the answers to people's problems if you're not first taking the time to really listen to them and understand what they've been through. Next, he said, talk in terms of the other person's interest. If we talk to people about what they are interested in, they will feel valued and value us in return. And lastly, he said, make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. The golden rule is to treat other people how we would want to be treated. And this is where the real work starts. It might sound simple, but it starts with your relationships, with your ability to build bonds with people who are different than you. I promise you, you can't do that if you're running around criticizing other people's every move or constantly tearing down leaders in the movement for not being as principled as you. And you certainly can't do it if you run around calling everybody libtards or statist. No one is going to want to work with you or be attracted to your ideas if you conduct yourself like this. The vast majority of Americans spend their entire lives in economic and societal bubbles. And what I mean by that is that you are very unlikely to know, and I mean intimately know, like have in your house on a regular basis, people of different nationalities, ethnicities, social classes, religions, or political parties. I'm very into psychology, as you can probably tell from this episode. And so I've been aware of this phenomena for some time and how it leads to racism and xenophobia and stereotypes that actually harm our society. When you do not intimately know people who are different than you, you cannot possibly understand their political motivations, their struggles, their needs, or the messages that will best reach them. I see this happen all the time on TikTok where I unfortunately spend way too much time these days. And I'll see a video that's made by somebody that's left-leaning and you can tell that they think this is just a super slam dunk, that they're owning the right, they're getting conservatives and libertarians, and they'll be doing something like going off on trickle-down economics and talking about how dumb people are who believe in that. And you can tell immediately that they've never spoken to an actual libertarian or conservative in their life because literally, no one ascribes trickle-down economics. It's actually a made-up term. No economist has ever even actually used that term to describe their theories. It was made up during the Reagan era by the press as an attack. And supporters of the free market would oppose that school of thought if it even did exist. Defenders of markets are certainly not going to support direct transfers or subsidies to the rich in any case. That's precisely the kind of crony capitalism that true libertarians reject. And on top of that, they're doing it in this very smug way, which really just makes people that they should be trying to convince dislike and discredit them. So if you want to persuade people, you must first know them intimately and build relationships with them or you'll end up looking really foolish. Most people change their minds on politics based on input from people that they know and respect. Once you've taken the steps to actually foster real relationships, you'll be in a position to actually affect change. But you need to be intentional in how you do this. Dale Carnegie also gives the following advice to win people to your way of thinking once you know them. 
He said the only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it. Whenever we argue with someone, no matter if we win or lose the argument, we actually still lose because the other person will either feel humiliated or strengthened and will only seek to bolster their own position. So he said we must try to avoid arguments wherever we can. Secondly, he said show respect for the other person's opinions. Instead of saying, you're wrong, say, that's an interesting thought. Here's where I agree, but actually I don't get this, I'm struggling with this, let's parse this out. Libertarians are smart cookies. Use that intellect to be smarter in how you talk to people. Three, he said if you're wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. When we admit that we are wrong, people trust us and begin to sympathize with our way of thinking. Next, he said start with questions to which the other person will answer yes. Do not begin by emphasizing the aspects in which you and the other person differ. Instead, begin by emphasizing and continue emphasizing the things on which you agree. People must be started in an affirmative direction if they're going to change their minds. And I'll give an example of that. Back when I was doing some volunteer work for NAMI, I was working pro bono, so I got to kind of pick what I was going to do and what I wasn't going to do. And at one point they came to me and they asked me to work on this bill that would uh, exclude people with severe mental illness from the death penalty. And I was like, nope, absolutely not. Can't do that one, not with you. And they said, what do you mean? I said, I support the death penalty. I, I can't work to get rid of it. I absolutely support it. And they said, but you hate the government. And I said, yeah. They said, but you, you think the government can't get anything right. You don't even think the government should be operating the post office. And I said, yeah. And they said, so don't you think the government probably gets it wrong in the criminal justice system? And I said, yeah. And they just kept doing that, right? They just kept getting me to say yes. And slowly in this conversation, I'm realizing that I don't know what I'm talking about and that I better go look into this because all of a sudden I'm recognizing that my values aren't lining up with the position I hold. But if they had not done that, if they had said had insulted me or put me down or even argued with me, I probably would have dug in my heels because I like to brawl. I like to debate. But they didn't do that. Instead, they showed respect for my opinions, just surprised that I held them. And they asked genuine questions without telling me flatly that I was wrong. They were friendly and they were really kind in their interaction. And it worked. Right? I then went and looked into the death penalty, changed my mind, went to the total opposite direction, and I ended up overturning the death penalty in three states. All of that might not have happened had they handled me differently. These kind of things matter. How you talk to people really matters. It has long-term impacts. Next, Carnegie said, let the other person feel the idea is theirs. People inherently like ideas that they come to on their own better than those that are handed to them. And he said to try honestly to see things from other people's point of view. Other people might be wrong, but when you condemn them, they dig in their heels. Instead, seek to understand them. Success in dealing with people requires a sympathetic grasp of the other person's viewpoint. I always say that if you are unable to articulate your opponent's point of view as accurately and thoroughly as they are, if not better, then you are not ready to enter the debate. Next, Carnegie said, be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. People are really hungry for sympathy. They want us to recognize everything that they desire and that they feel, and if you can sympathize with them, they will appreciate your side as well and will often come around to your way of thinking. Next, he said, appeal to the nobler motives of people. People believe that they do things for noble and morally upright reasons. So if you can appeal to those motivations, you can successfully convince them to follow your ideas. And then lastly, he said, dramatize your ideas. Boy, do libertarians struggle here. We need to use entertainment and stories and intrigue to express our ideas. Don't go around throwing white papers and research at people. They don't want your data. I know we like it, but most people don't want that. The last set of instructions from Carnegie's book that I want to leave you with are those that he gives for changing people without arousing resentment. And this is so important because the vast majority of people in politics do the exact opposite of these things, and they fail because of it. So he said you should begin with praise and honest appreciation. People will do things begrudgingly for criticism and an iron-fisted leader, but they will work wonders when they are praised and appreciated. So cheer on the good things people do instead of nitpicking them on areas you dislike. And I see this all the time with politicians or other people in our movement where people will just constantly tear them down and criticize them because they're not real libertarians or not being principled enough. And what that does is actually make those people less likely to want to work with you. Whereas if you praise people in a genuine and sincere way when they're doing things that are good, they will tend to want to move further and further in that direction and do more things that are good and earn more praise. You just have to be smart about how you work with people and recognize that you can encourage people in the right direction. Secondly, Carnegie said to call attention to people's mistakes indirectly. No one likes to make mistakes, especially in front of others. To the largest extent that you can, he said, contact people privately and gently. 
And I think this is so accurate because as somebody who's on social media, I can see both sides of this. When people are criticizing me in my comments and, and tearing me down or telling me how wrong I am about something, it's not really likely to get my attention or make me want to change my position and I tend to feel attacked. Where somebody who sends me a direct message on Facebook and says, hey, just wanted to let you know like you messed up on this or I think you got this wrong, that actually means a lot to me because I recognize that person wants me to get it right, they're in my corner, and they're working to correct me privately so that I can do better moving forward. It's a vastly different circumstance. One works, one doesn't. Carnegie also said to talk about your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. When something goes wrong, taking responsibility can help win others to your side. And this was a technique I used very effectively in lobbying back in the day because I would start off by telling the other person or the politician about times that I had been wrong or times I had changed my mind. And that then gave them permission to also be wrong and also change their mind without being shamed for it. Next, Carnegie said to praise every improvement. If we truly want someone to improve at something, he said we must praise their every advance. And he said to give the other person a fine reputation to live up to. If you believe the best in others, they will not want to let you down. They're going to want to live up to your estimation of them. And he said to use encouragement. Make the fault seem easy to correct. If a desired outcome seems like a huge task, people will give up and lose heart. But if a fault seems easy to correct, they will readily jump at the opportunity to improve. Now, I know some of you may have listened to Martin Luther King Jr.'s Six Principles of Nonviolence and Dale Carnegie's Rules for Winning Friends and Making People Like You and thought, this sounds obvious, this is common sense, it's a walk in the park. Maybe for some of you, but for me, these are the greatest battles of my life. They force me to work against my human nature and my instincts, and I fail to practice what I'm preaching here all the time. I mess up constantly. But I keep working towards these values because I know the power that can be found when they are put into practice. It is through these tools and techniques that you can build movements. The point of politics is persuasion. And in my belief, it is persuading people to be true and consistent champions of free markets and individual liberty. If you're in this movement for any other reason, please get out. But before you can build coalitions, before you can effectively create content that messages your views and wins people to them, before you can lobby or pass bills, before you can draft litigation that zaps bad government laws, before you can do any of the actual political actions to change the country, you must first learn these interpersonal skills. You must first build these kinds of relationships. There's really no shortcut to it. And this is my theory of change. I think the speediest way to political change is through peaceful, determined civil disobedience. I think we must seek to win 3.5% of the population to our way of thinking and ultimately convince them to join us in civil disobedience against injustice. And to do this, we should rely on the proven tactics of Dale Carnegie's rules to win friends and influence people and Martin Luther King Jr.'s principles of nonviolence. I also would encourage people to pick an issue and pick a lane. As I mentioned at the start, there is so much injustice and corruption that it is overwhelming. You cannot possibly affect change in every area you're likely going to want to but you can pick the one you are most passionate about and lead on it. And I think this is kind of a calling, something that will be laid at your heart. And we need people in our movement to have different callings. For me, it's been criminal justice reform. And while there are many other things I care about, this one just hits differently. I can't not do this work. I can't not speak on it. And once I realized that, I spent a lot of time working to become an expert on the subject. I studied the data, the system, the laws, the history. I looked at other country systems. I interviewed people impacted, judges and prosecutors, defense attorneys, cops, victims, perpetrators, jury members, court reporters, lab techs. And then I picked one area under the umbrella to hone in on, which was the death penalty. And I just went ham on it for about three years. And I remember, like I said, when I took over conservatives concerned about the death penalty, I had some people tell me I'd never pass a bill. They said all blue states had already overturned it and this issue was dead on arrival. I was told I'd be pigeonholed, blacklisted, seen as fringe, that I might not get other jobs after that. And these were things that people told me who liked me and wanted me to be successful. There was much worse said by my haters. But I felt compelled to do the work. And when I went all in, my passion seemed to catch fire. Other people started rallying to the cause and ultimately a state overturned the death penalty every single year I was in that role. The evangelist Billy Graham once said, when a strong man takes a stand, the spines of others are stiffened. And I know that's true. So pick an issue, take a stand, and people will begin to stand next to you. You're gonna watch that line of people increase each day you work on it. And over time, you're not going to feel alone anymore because you will have built an army. So get to work. I can't wait to see what you do. There is so much potential. And until next month, stay based.